Zendras. A similar event that would prove the authenticity of our experience through the interdimensional doors occurred later on April 25th, 1977 in Chile, three years after J.J. Benitez had documented what we had experienced in Chilca. The Chilean event occurred on that date at 4.15 a.m., 150 kilometers from Arica at the Peruvian border, when Corporal Armando Valdez Garrido and seven other soldiers of the Rancagua Regiment were near the region of Pampas de Yuscuma in the mountains of Putre, chasing traffickers and smugglers. With no previous warning, they saw two lights, similar to stars, descending slowly. One of them touched ground at a distance of 500 meters from where the troop was stationed. It was an oval luminous haze that emitted a strong violet light. Suddenly, that strange, luminous, thick, and compact mist began to move towards the soldiers. The corporal approached the light slowly, asking his soldiers to give him cover, and very curious to see what it was, with his gun at the ready, he entered and disappeared into the light. After 15 minutes, the corporal reappeared, 60 meters behind the soldiers, staggering and dazed. He was goggle-eyed and looked as if he hadn't shaved for days, despite his short absence. He seemed to be in a trance. His watch displayed the time of 4.30, but its calendar indicated a date five days in advance. Before he fainted, he murmured some words to his companions. You don't know who we are nor where we come from, but we will come back. Even after several examinations by the Chilean army, it was impossible to make him remember where he had been or what happened to him. Tonight... My sister Rose said simply, we've registered one more historic event in our lives. I think the guides will have more experiences of this kind in other places to confirm ours. How right she was. With the sound of our voices echoing on its slopes, the mine vanished in the darkness of the night as we returned to our vehicles to begin the journey back home to Lima, where my father waited impatiently for our news. Although his relationship with my brother was a little cooler, my father and I were on good terms and we sometimes exchanged ideas relating to contact experiences. Obviously, I kept him informed of each new adventure. This experience had been very special because for the first time, Oxalk had appeared physically to us and had accomplished an impressive phenomenon of levitation with Marina. During our journey back home, I remembered the whole scene step by step. Everything was so incredible. I had witnessed the encounter of two worlds, separated by a gap of millenniums of civilization and development. But there, right in front of me, these two realities gave way to the beginning of a new one, ours. Six those words hammered in my mind, accompanied by the image of his altered face. Why? What for? How far will they go? Who will be next? I asked myself. I was worried and puzzled. I could not envision the future. There was no program, no detailed route, no indication of what would come. The great adventure had turned out to be fantastic and beyond all expectations, but I was beginning to feel a little afraid and anxious. Oxalk's imposing, impressive, overwhelming presence engulfed my mind's eye. All was happening too quickly for careful analysis. My anxiety was unsettling. The following days were rather turbulent on top of it all. The frequent conversations with Sixto, the answers to the questions asked by all those who learned about the experience only made me feel worse. I think that in fact, I was afraid, afraid that something bad and unfortunate might happen to someone. Perhaps afraid I would not know how to act when my turn came to be the leading actor of the event. My thoughts were meandering in this vein when some members of the group received the communication for a new general field outing the following weekend. Mochi was included. The preparations were no different from other times, except for a greater sense of expectation. The message said that we were all invited to participate in a new stage of experiences that would be called Gimbra. It consisted of the appearance of Zendras, which were dimensional doors similar to the one we had seen with Oxalk. The only difference was that this time several people would go through. No wonder we were all worried and curious, for this time groups of people would be invited to go through a Zendra to who knows where. Anyway, it would be free and probably very far, with no bother about passports or money. The experience of interdimensional transportation was confirmed in several messages received by different people and on different dates. None of those persons had passed 
the message on to their, to their companions, and so it represented the best evidence that the convocation was real. After nearly a week of intense psychological and physical preparation, a rigorous diet had been set by the guides to better our physical condition, our general condition was satisfactory. In fact, besides being terribly hungry because of the fruit diet, I was still tense and worried. I did my best to change my unpleasant disposition, but it was difficult. Finally, Saturday came. Early in the morning, the group met at my house to go over the instructions the guides had given. The participants were divided into small groups of at least four or five with one coordinator, as indicated by the guides. The small group that was given to me consisted of my sister Rose, my cousin Anna Maria, David, and myself. We were only four, the smallest group. After that, we got into the cars and left for Chilka. Never before, never before had the journey been so quick. Almost one hour later, we arrived at the sand dunes near Papa Leon 13. Progressing slowly in the soft sand, we chose our way carefully to avoid sinking and stopping. Leaving the vehicles behind, we then walked towards the plain where the mine was. The night was clear and the stars were peacefully bright in that immensity. Everything looked tranquil and the silence of the place was broken only by the conversation of the members of the group. A few minutes later, the journey came to an end. Insecurity, fear, I really did not know what I felt. On the one hand, I was glad to be there with all the others for a new contact. But on the other hand, I had worrying thoughts. Sixto was coordinating the practice and suggested some relaxation, which I found an excellent idea. The group formed a circle, sitting on the sand in the lotus position. Sixto induced the group to relax, speaking about the importance of our presence there and the opportunity we were being given. He commented on the remarks of the guides about the necessity to change and assume the commitment for a reformulation of values. Each word exploded in my mind like a bomb, making my heart beat faster. But his words helped eventually. Little by little, my panic was replaced with an agreeable sensation of calm. Gradually, I relaxed, and after so many days of restlessness, I could at last find peace. After 45 minutes of relaxation, the groups began to get together to begin work. A hysterical cry from one of the girls stopped all movement. Everybody stood still, shocked, and looked in the direction the girl was pointing. At the top of one of the hills was a strangely shaped object. It was like a banana, bent like a boomerang, approximately 25 meters end to end. It had an orange light that flashed on each end and in the center, a kind of big bluish window. We watched the object with curiosity and made a timid approach. We slowly got nearer and had a wonderful surprise. A few meters from the landed object was a member of the crew, standing and looking at us calmly. The being was less than 1,000 meters from the group, and although it was not a dark night, we could see his silhouette against the lights of the spaceship. We could not distinguish any details, but it was clearly an extraterrestrial. The practice had hardly begun, and the participants were already excited with the impact of that moment. Everybody expressed their excitement somehow. We all pointed and talked, asking ourselves if what we saw before us was real. We turned to one another for confirmation. Three other similar objects came from behind the mountains and added to the already emotionally shaken state of the group. Sixto tried to calm everyone down, asking the groups to organize themselves for the beginning of the practice and continuation of the work. It was not easy to maintain order in a group of about 25 people with that show going on close by, as well as above our heads. But finally, the group succeeded in assembling at the places indicated for each of them. Although we wanted to pay more attention to what was flying over our heads, we slowly began to do some concentration exercises. At that moment, the boomerang-shaped spaceships each shone beams from their belly down at each group. At the same time, a cupola of light formed by a bright bluish mist materialized right behind me, about five or six meters from the place where we were working. All the members of my small group, including me, became restless. I must confess that even after all the previous preparation and experiences, my emotions were stronger than my reasoning, and I was so much at a loss that I could hardly stand still. Just then I felt that a message was trying to come into my confused mind. Amongst my thoughts, I heard the words, calm down, relax, don't worry, everything is all right, and a pleasant sensation of peace pervaded my whole body. Rose, 
Rose had run to me when Azendra was projected beside us. Frightened, she held me tight and would not let go. Anna Maria and David had also come close, their faces showing apprehension. Communication had been established and messages flowed explaining the purpose of the phenomena. Tranquility returned to the groups. The spaceships hovered at low altitude and the dimensional doors awaited us. Godar, my guide, informed me that David would be the first and that he should walk into the light. The guides were waiting for him on the other side and everything was under control. I gave David the message and he said that his guide also had told him to go on and not to worry. Armed with a great deal of courage, David looked at us, waved, and walked towards the light. Step by step, while trying to maintain our calm, we accompanied his movements and watched him disappear inside that mass of light. A quarter of an hour later, David came back from the interior of the light, staggering. He looked uneasy, and it took him a few seconds to pull himself together and walk towards us. A little dizzy, he informed us that it had been an amazing experience. He said Anna Maria would be next and that she should not be afraid because everything was, was part of the practice and the guides did not wish us harm. Anna Maria got up, signaled she was ready, and said that if she did not come back, we should inform her boyfriend that he should await a postcard from Jupiter. Smiling, she went to meet her destiny. To see our cousin disappear into the light was too much for Rose, who began to cry, frightened. Unsure of what to do, I tried to calm her while David began to tell us about his experience. When he entered the light, he felt dizzy and felt a slight burning on his skin. At the end of the light, he found himself in a room where there were two very tall men whose description reminded me of the crew of Antar Sharar. These guides spoke to him about his performance and the purpose of his task and advised him to ponder the responsibility of that encounter and how much his life would change. Right then, Anna Maria came out of the light also a little dizzy. Approaching the group, she cried out the name of her guide, Gexo, excitedly. She felt very happy, danced and laughed, and encouraged Rose to get up and go to the light. Rose waited a minute, looked at us, dried her tears, breathed deeply, got up and began to walk towards the light. And there was Zangsa, the extraterrestrial guide from Apu, who was Rose's contact. My sister was paralyzed looking at her in astonishment. We were all there gaping at the image of that wonderful woman, almost 1.92 meters tall, with long hair tied in a ponytail that fell to one side. Zangsa did not wear a hood like the crew of Antar's spaceship, but wore the same classic coverall. She had a fringe of thin hair covering her forehead. Her eyes were almond-shaped, slanting, and of unique beauty. Rose seemed to have fallen into a hypnotic trance. She stood stiff in front of Zangsa. After about 10 or 15 minutes, the guide turned back into the light. Rose turned, staggered a few steps, and fell to the ground. She was completely dizzy and shaking with emotion. David, Anna Maria, and I held her arms. We brought her to where the knapsacks were and tried to make her comfortable to rest and drink some water. As I was supposed to be next, however, I asked David to be in charge of the group and began to walk to the energy door. But it suddenly disappeared. And at the same time, I received a message saying that I would not share in that experience. It was like being doused with a bucket of cold water, icy cold. I felt helpless and stood there, looking at the place where the light had been. I watched as the spaceships maneuvered and vanished into the immensity of the night, leaving me dumbfounded. Minutes went by, and still I could not believe what had happened. My concentration was broken by Anna Maria's hand on my shoulder, asking me to head back to the cars. It was all finished, and I had not partaken of that event. Back at the cars, I could hear all the boys talking and laughing excitedly about the incredible adventure on the other side of the doors. Some of them had been taken individually to a room similar to the one David and Anna Maria had been to. Others, on the contrary, had been sent in a group to a meeting with what they thought was the Council of the 24, uh, the Council of the Venerable Elders of the Confederation, which coordinates the work of prospecting and investigation of the civilizations affiliated with the Milky Way and administers the interworld's technological, economic, and social exchange. Some of them asked me where I had been taken, and at each answer, they looked at me as if I was a strange animal. The fact that I had not been anywhere seemed to them evidence that I was somehow unworthy, a sinner. 
Anyway, I did not pay much mind to what they thought of me because I was feeling really disheartened. I felt so disconnected that I left the group to look for a corner where I could hide my sadness and desolation. Mentally, I blamed myself for not having trusted the extraterrestrials and for being so insecure. My fears had caused the loss of a marvelous experience. I sat silently on a hillside, isolated from the exhilaration of the boys, and tried to understand the reason for the discrimination. I was tortured by the fact that after so many experiences together, I would not be able to accompany the group any longer. My road on that incredible adventure seemed to have ended today, but I could not accept that idea. It was too cruel to be real. I wonder if the extraterrestrials will punish me for having doubted their intentions. I wonder if I'll be expelled because I dared question them. A stray tear, fruit of that melancholy, fell onto the dry ground. My thoughts were racing in an all-out attempt to understand that cold, cruel abandonment when engulfed by these chaotic ideas, I felt Goddard's presence. A chill went down my spine. I looked around for a signal. The night was still silent and the sounds of the group echoed in the mountains around me. Once again, I felt something behind me. I was startled and stood up, searching. A message took form in my frightened mind. It was Godar with his pleasant, tender voice trying to calm down the storm inside me. Conscious of his presence in my thoughts, I got a whole sea of questions and despair off my chest, looking for answers. A gentle quietness filled my mind. In that hypnotic torpor, I heard a voice that said, Come, turn to the right, and go ahead. I was suspicious and initially hesitated. I felt insecure, but I made up my mind quickly, drew a deep breath, and followed the direction indicated. I had nothing to lose. I walked uphill with Godar, indicating the path I should take, right, left, or straight ahead. A few minutes later, I reached a depression at the top of a hill right at the bottom of the valley. The group was a few kilometers behind, but even so, I could still hear the echo of their voices in the distance and see the faint gleam of their flashlights. I looked around and could not avoid the feeling of fear of a possible adverse situation. Godar stopped talking in my thoughts. I was in an isolated place, shielded by the higher hills in the valley. The cars on the highway could be seen in the distance. They were small dots of light against the darkness of the night. For a moment, I looked at those cars and thought of the people in them who hadn't the slightest idea of what was going on a short distance away from them. They would never have imagined how close they had been to such transcendental events in human history and that they had driven close to a scene where people were trying to unravel the mysteries of the universe. My thoughts were abruptly distracted when I saw that a few meters from me, a light similar to the Zendras began to form. I instinctively backed a few steps and although my heart raced, I tried not to run. Actually, it was a dimensional door that slowly took form right in front of me, slowly increasing its intensity. In the same proportion, my heartbeats increased. Trying to control my panic, I saw a huge figure coming out of the light with his right hand up. He was about two and a half meters tall, had a medieval haircut, slanting almond-shaped eyes, and apparently 35, 38 years old. He wore bluish coveralls, high leg boots made of what looked like bronze plates and a wide belt. He looked like the beings I had seen in Antar Sherar's spaceship, but there was something familiar about this one. I tried to control my shaken nerves. It was too much for one night, and I felt really worn out. A voice came into my thoughts again and said, Calm down. Don't worry. I don't mean any harm. Try and find a way for our minds to share the same feeling. Peace. I'm Godar the one you found in your search. You will be called for another practice at this same place next Saturday. After you have arrived, leave your group and come straight to this place. I'll be waiting for you. I could not believe my eyes. At last, I was face to face with the Apunian extraterrestrial with whom I had been communicating for months. I could see his figure, his gestures, his clothes. It was simply astounding, wonderful. I was so moved and excited that I forgot all the questions and doubts that had worried my soul so painfully a few minutes ago. I felt as if I was looking at a kind of angel. His physical beauty and his features inspired awe, but there was a certain purity in his eyes that penetrated to my depths and calmed me down. When he finished speaking, he went back into the light with the same gesture of his hand again. The door of light immediately disappeared. Then I fell to the ground. 
it was really too much emotion for one night. My mind was blank except for Godar's image that was still glued to my retina. It took me some minutes to recover. I looked at my watch and saw it was very late. Uh, worried that I would be left behind by the group, I ran towards them. They had been looking for me to go back to town. They noticed that there was something strange, asked me if I was all right, and I answered that I was. And I did not know if I should tell them about Godar's appearance and decided to keep quiet. The commitment for the following Saturday had dispelled any frustration, feeling of failure or sadness for not having participated in the experiences of the rest of the group. I suspected something extraordinary was going to happen. I did not know exactly what, but I knew the extraterrestrials were planning something. Anyway, I would be part of it after all. I had been neither forgotten nor set apart as I had thought. They only needed something special from me. What? Back in Lima, my father could hardly believe the boys' stories about their trips into the doors of light. They were unbelievable, but the great majority had points in common. Almost all the ones who had had the experience said they had been transported to enclosed places, that is, rooms where they had been expected by beings from Apu or Orion, always in twos or more. The conversations with those beings were about the responsibility of a training, like the need to elicit a commitment from humanity, their disposition to help, and the importance of establishing closer contact in the future. Sixto's group was the only one that had made the trip with all its members simultaneously to Moreland, where apparently the Council of 24 were holding a meeting. According to the group, they landed in a large round room with a cupola covered with symbols among which they could see a six-pointed star similar to the Magin David, the symbol of Israel, and a trident quite similar to the symbol of the Greek god of the seas, Poseidon, or Neptune. The floor was polished like metal, bright, circular. Two rows uh, of 12 armchairs were arrayed along the walls on both sides. In front of them, there were stands with ideograms or strange symbols that differentiated one from the other. According to the description, it looked like Phoenician ideograms or runic writing. In front of the group and between the two rows of chairs, there were six torches, three on each side, with a kind of altar or tabernacle in the center. A kind of winter garden could be seen with colored flowers of great beauty, protected by a crystal urn. At the bottom, you could see the same six-pointed star engraved in the structure. The 24 places were occupied by beings of different shapes. The variety of characteristics, sizes, and races was surprising although the great majority had a humanoid morphological configuration. They were too distant to be able to distinguish the counselors' faces in detail. The atmosphere of the room inspired concentration and respect. The place had perfect acoustics, so each sound could be clearly heard, but at the time it was silent. Uh, one of the places near the group was occupied by a being whose physical appearance was quite similar to a human. The being had long hair and a thick white beard, looking more like a Viking than an extraterrestrial. He rose and pointed to the tabernacle and said, This place, the importance of which you can't comprehend, represents the biggest mystery of the whole of creation. Here, we contemplate the rarest wonder, simple and wonderful life. Deaths. Of all searches the intelligent creature could undertake, this one is the hardest, the most painful, and takes the longest to accomplish. During one's existence and the consciousness of being and living a full life, the search for the comprehension of the mystery of our origins represents the first act of intelligence that transcends time and space, trying to unravel the ultimate enigma, the dwelling of the architect of life, the extension of the generating power, the origin of the sower of spirits, and the nature of the creative force. This urn represents the respect we pay to the most precious gift of our intelligence, the capacity to feel and recognize the existence of a power whose intensity and objectives are not always clear and whose logic is beyond our comprehension. The most important question ever asked by any civilization was to query the real purpose of their existence and the reason for being here now. Anyway, the fact that we are here now means that somehow we are part of a universal plan. We have been created to discover the creator, understand the reason why we are imperfect, and find the way to achieve perfection. The difficulties on the road to evolution are intentional and are part of creation. We strive to be conscious of that and to understand its objective. 
According to Sixto, everybody heard the being's words, but nobody could tell if he really spoke or if they were received mentally. The group was totally overwhelmed and did not know how to react. Oxalk appeared beside them and lead the way back out. At the end of their visit, Oxalk said to them, in ancient times, other civilizations existent in your world that were destroyed by lack of vision and humility. We don't want it to happen again, so we will help. Now you must go. In a moment, through the door of light, they were at Chilka again. Another crazy adventure added to our field experiences and one more headache for my father. It was far beyond any kind of science fiction film. My father was in a terrible quandary as to whether or not to accept our stories. The days went by as usual, but my classes at college could not distract my mind from Godar and his invitation. I could not resist the temptation and told Rose about my meeting with Godar. She was moved, happy, and curious about what would happen on the appointed day. In fact, during the first days of that week, messages were received, calling the rest of the group for another outing to Chilka. Finally, that Saturday in July, arrived. I remember I counted the minutes and the seconds till the journey to Chilka began. Rose noticed my anxiety. We got into the cars and left. We didn't have any problems on the road. When we reached our destination, we left the car in the usual spot and walked on. I was so excited that I could hardly keep from outpacing the group. I waved to Rose and walked towards the hills. While I walked on, Sixto and Rose watched me, worried. Sixto did not know why I was going, so Rose told him. Tired and anxious, I got to the place. The night was cool, and the exercise had warmed me up. I was breathless. From a small promontory, I saw the place where the group was gathering to begin work. The message had indicated that the work with the Zendras would continue that night. Punctually, the boomerang spaceships showed up near the valley. A low hum filled the silence of the night, and the group split into smaller ones. It was in the same place where the energy door had appeared one week before. I sat in the lotus position to relax, closed my eyes, and began a meditation to contact Godar mentally. A few minutes later, I felt a gentle, warm breeze. The different temperature made me open my eyes, and right in front of me, the door of light appeared again. My heart beat faster, and I immediately jumped up to my feet. I think I stepped back, waiting for Godar. Funny, I was not afraid anymore, but was still wrapped in strong emotion. The door was open, and I was expecting Godar. I waited a few minutes, but the extraterrestrial did not come. I began to feel impatient and worried. Curious to examine the energy door, I picked up my knapsack and approached slowly. It was fascinating, a vortex of bluish light that seemed to pulse. When I reached out my hand trying to touch the light, I felt Godar's voice saying, Come into the light. I'm waiting for you. My guide had contacted me and was asking me to go in. I hesitated and backed up a few steps. What shall I do? Shall I go in or not? I debated. Although I was afraid, I followed my instinct, breathed deeply, and went ahead. It was terrifying. I was in a corridor of dim light with an invisible compulsion that pushed me forward and that I could not stop. My skin was hot, burned, and I had a painful headache. The air was heavy and cold. For a few seconds, everything was bright and blinded me. A few steps from me in the mist, I could see a yellowish light that looked like the exit. I walked towards it quickly and crossed out of the light in one jump. Then I felt a smashing pressure on my chest that threw me to the ground and left me breathing with difficulty. At the same time, I felt a warm liquid running down from my nose. I pulled out my handkerchief to wipe my nose and saw it was blood. My nose was bleeding. Dizzy from the experience and suffering from the pain all over my body, I found myself kneeling on ground that was paved with finely cut stones. I was somewhere that obviously was not Chilka. I raised my eyes and was amazed with what I saw. It was daylight, or at least it looked like it. There were large fields of gardens with paths paved with stones, and in the background I could see the buildings of a town. About 50 meters from me, I saw a figure that seemed to be Godar, his right hand raised, waving to me. I stood up and began to observe in detail. Behind me, there was no door any longer. Only the end of a solid stone wall artificially cut against which there was a flower bed that ran along the wall as far as you could see. This flower bed was made of small juxtaposed stones and there were extremely beautiful flowers and plants. I could never have imagined such bright colors. 
Along all the extensions of the flower bed, both to the right and to the left, there was a stone sidewalk. When I looked at the sky, I saw that the slopes of rock behind me went upwards, forming a gigantic cupola. Um, what looked like the sky was actually an enormous quantity of lights arranged in long rows along the whole ceiling. I realized I was in the interior of a fantastic, gigantic cavern, artificially built. I deduced I was in a kind of underground base and that Chilka was on the surface right above us. I approached Godar slowly, looking around for details. The grass in the gardens was the color of beetroot, a bright red, contrasting with the white, yellow, green flowers of various shades and shapes. The light bay, beige cut stones were arranged into an orderly road, three meters wide and a few kilometers long. Godar was waiting for me, his hands behind him. He wore a kind of loose, long white tunic with golden and silver details and trimming, like the Roman togas. The sleeves were also loose and the collar was circular. He wore a golden belt with a kind of clasp with a crystal in its center. The tunic came down below his knees. He wore high leg boots made of some material similar to leather with golden metallic details. His clothes looked like the ones he was wearing on the day of the first Zendra at Chilka, but the details and style were different. Anyway, I was completely amazed. Godar broke my trance with a gesture of his hand inviting me to follow him. The guide walked towards the city and I followed. He was extremely tall, more than two meters. I did not quite reach his chest. It was difficult to keep up with his long strides and I lagged behind. The city was, I think, five or six kilometers from where I had landed. I had the impression that the level of the terrain where I walked was higher than the base of the city. The buildings were huge, seemingly made of concrete and painted with acrylic colors, for you could see their bright surfaces even at such a distance. The architectonical structures looked semicircular and roundish. One building contrasted with all the rest. It looked like a gigantic column rising from the ground to the top of the ceiling, and its polyhedric lines made it look quite different from all the other buildings. As we strode along towards the city, I caught glimpses of the end of the cavern. It was difficult to calculate the distances. Very large fields and gardens were distributed around the city, imparting the idea of a strategic design. The road where we were was one of many others that converged on the city. At each step, I noticed we were closer to the center of the structure. Suddenly, as I was studying some bushes in the fields, I saw a group of beings similar to Godar, sitting in a circle on the grass. I felt like stopping and approaching them to see what they were doing. Having taken only a few steps, I noticed a large young lion lying on the grass among them. The presence of the animal made me jump back and start running away. Godar looked at me with a funny smile. It was too much. I felt anxious and wanted to know where we were. I suspected we were underground in the mountain region of the mine, so I asked, how deep are we below Chilka? Godar looked surprised. Pointing to the city, he said, you are not at Chilka, Charlie, not even in your country. We are more than four light years from Earth. This city is called Illumin the operational center of the planet you call Apu in the system called Alpha Centauri by your scientists. I was surprised and replied, but how is it possible? Nobody can travel in space like that. I have just arrived and it is impossible to cover such a distance in only a few minutes, even at light speed. The guide smiled patiently and I could see that his teeth were not like a human's. They looked like whitish plates, one beside the other. He answered, still walking. Although we can consider you a relatively advanced society, your knowledge about space travel is rather restricted. Your spaceships were designed imitating the flight of the birds from place to place, but ours try to imitate the behavior of the planets. While you try to go long distances in less time, you make basic mistakes. Consider this. 500 years ago, a man called Magalheis went round the world on a journey that took two years. Later, with the development of aeronautics, a jet plane could do the same in 10 to 12 hours. And with a spaceship of your technology, it now takes only two hours. Although 500 years have elapsed, man is still using a vehicle for transportation. His physical space has not changed, but technology has allowed him to reduce the time spent on the journey. But what has actually changed? What is the difference? simply the environment in which the journey took place. In old times, it was by sea where it met the resistance of the waves and the displacement caused by the winds. 
Then by air, where it fought friction, the limitation of altitude, and the influence of acceleration. And finally, nowadays, he travels through space, taking advantage of gravity fields. Each change in the means of transportation allowed man to considerably alter the time spent in travel. This example shows that through technology, it is possible to discover and identify alternative methods that will enable him to conquer long distances in less time. This option is represented by the dimensional doors. They act like ducts, tunnels, artificially built to reduce the distance and the time spent on a journey. If you had traveled at light speed, it would have taken you at least four years to get here. And according to your scientists and the relativistic concepts, that time would be multiplied on Earth. So uh, traveling at light speed would take you only four years in space, but several dozens of years on Earth. And if we consider the journey back to the Earth, it would take you four more years but a few dozen more of Earth time. So you would get back home around a century later, but you would be only eight years older. The trip would have lost its objective, and technically you would be outdated, for you would find a completely different world. It is obvious that traveling at light speed is not the right alternative either to overcome the problem of space distances. The answer is in the route, as well as in the means used to cover the course. This is why we use the Xendras, with them, we can alter the relationship of time in another space. All that information impressed me and gave me pause for thought. When he spoke, I watched his lips in an attempt to see any movement that would show verbalization, but I could see nothing. He was communicating with me mentally, but I had the impression that I could hear him. Godar continued his explanation. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, but if you decided to leave Lima and walked in a straight line to Chilka, would it really be a straight line? Of course not. Your planet, as any other, is spherical. And even by flying, you would be describing a curve. Also, the lights of the stars that you see in the sky occupy a fictitious place. Besides being in direct contact with a distant past, for the light you see was sent off millions of years ago, this light is situated in a place determined by its course in space. Light is also matter and as such is subordinated to gravity and undergoes changes in its course. The image you see is relatively real for its situation is the result of the interaction of gravitational force. And it's light. It is the image of something that existed in an ancient past. Terrestrial physics and astrophysics are dropping the idea of the existence of a universe rigid in its laws and merely tridimensional, where light, width, and depth are the only determinant elements. Although the factor of space-time is taken into account nowadays to judge the tetradimensionality of the universe, there is still one more factor of great importance to be taken into consideration, the nature and state of the matter-energy that forms the universe itself. The concepts relating to this aspect are still the cause of heated polemics between experts who try to determine to what extent light is energy and matter at the same time, or if radiation is matter or simple energy. And what is most difficult, up to what extent energy is manifested and transmitted in a determined frequency, or if it is actually possible. The universe we can see is only a form of energy vibrating at a determined frequency. As radio and television waves coexist without interfering with each other, there are innumerable universes coexisting at different levels or dimensions. Their mass is manifested in differentiated frequencies of vibration where time and space conditions are different from the ones where we are. The Zendra's doors are tunnels that join us to other dimensions, acting as decodifiers of the frequencies of universal levels. On each, they break through time and also make distances non-existent. All these statements overwhelmed me. Although I was capable of learning at the university level, I did not have enough time to assimilate his information. I was too anxious and astonished to realize the importance of what Godard was saying. It was difficult for me to believe and simply accept the idea that right at that moment, I was having a conversation with an extraterrestrial in the middle of an avenue of an alien city somewhere on a distant planet of the Milky Way. It was too crazy. Still surprised with Godar's explanation and with all that was happening, I looked again at that group with the lion and asked, please tell me, that is a terrestrial animal, isn't it? What is it doing here? Godar walked on towards the city and signaled with his hand for me to follow him. I hurried to his side. 
He answered, As you can see, we are in an underground city, but it was not like that in the past. In very old times that we can't remember, we were an immature, arrogant society. Our scientists thought they could alter the natural order of things and began to interfere in the delicate atmospheric structure of this planet. Because of a serious mistake, the balance of the gases that constituted the air we breathed and also the protective atmospheric layers were destroyed. Very quickly, the degeneration of the air destroyed all kinds of life. Radiation from space completed the destruction. It found no obstacle. The only survivors were the ones who were already living in the space colonies or traveling in space. Uh, our world died together with its population, native fauna and flora, for there had been no time to save anything. Thousands of years later, we decided to return and rebuild our civilization on our original planet, but the surface was still destroyed and contaminated. We opted to leave the surface as it was. The debris of the past on a dead surface would serve as a monument to what technical and intellectual arrogance could cause. Future generations would be able to learn where our megalomaniacal, presumptuous attitude had led us. So we built these huge caverns and adapted them to our life. In all, there are 24 cities like this one, composed of residential modules, factories of basic production, research, administration, leisure, medical support units, piers, supply centers, thermal units, etc., 12 industrial centers of general production, processing and research for different segments of consumers, seven experimental and producing agricultural centers, three building complexes for events and visitors, seven transportation centers and repair hubs, six educational and training complexes, eight hospital centers for care and regeneration, and finally, 12 units for environmental control. Although each city is structurally self-sufficient, the industrial and research centers develop risky work. That's why certain areas of activity are set far apart from the others. On the other hand, the educational and training centers contain all the basic scientific, operational, and cultural activities, and they need a special particular structure that allows the concentration of learning resources. For that purpose, over thousands of years, we imported different forms of life. Plants and animals were brought from every country we visited, not only for scientific study or sources of nourishment and raw materials, but mainly to form a new biosphere. All the plants you see are part of this landscape, not only as decoration, but also as a complex structure that is part of the environmental control of our city. Temperature, humidity, gases are all linked. There is no more efficient environmental balance than the interaction of life itself. The lion you saw is part of a study. The team with it is analyzing the animal's reaction to telepathic contact and trying to learn more intensively how its behavior is affected by its instinct of self-preservation. I listened to the guide. I noticed that my movements were easily performed. I did not feel any resistance or uneasiness caused by gravity or pressure. To the contrary, I felt a strange lightness. Godar looked at me and interrupted what he was saying to explain that the local gravity was artificially controlled by the environmental control units, as well as the temperature, atmosphere, pressure, etc. He also said that the first inhabitants of the planet, his ancestors, were physically different and that after thousands of years of technology and advances in genetics, the characteristics of the species were changed into what they were today. That whole process was developed in the space colonies where they slowly adapted to their new environment. When they got back to their native planet, they had to make a few adjustments, not only for themselves, but also for the survival of other forms of life. As we talked and walked on the stone road, I could see the city coming closer step by step. It was an architect's dream. The buildings were roundish, globular, or with a cupola. They seemed to be made of acrylic, plastic, or something similar. Some were transparent, others were red, yellow, gray, smoky, sky blue, white. I had the impression that each one of them had been built with only one piece of acrylic, for no joints could be seen. There were raised platforms joining the structures, looking like aerial roads between the buildings. A few objects flew quietly over the buildings and landed on their tops or lateral platforms. Everything was fantastic. There are no words to express the beauty and magnificence of what I saw. I could never have dreamed of such a sight. I was so excited that my heart beat faster. 
Every time I thought of where I was, I felt pressure on my chest. Some moments I was overjoyed, others frightened or deeply moved. That combination began to tire me, but curiosity kept me going. When I was about 100 meters from the city, I saw that it was actually at a different level. The road, as well as the gardens, formed a platform above the city, corresponding to the height of a two-story building. So we would have to walk down a descending zigzag ramp to get to the level of the streets. We arrived at the back of a block of buildings. The ramp ran along the side, forming wide corridors. Near the access to the city, I saw another being approaching, similar to Godar, but younger. I was a little afraid and stopped, refusing to go on. Godar noticed and stopped too. The individual walked past me. He looked young, about 25, wore the usual coverall, smiled gently, and gave me a piercing look. I felt as if his look penetrated my thoughts. It made me feel defenseless and naked. I felt like an aborigine in the middle of civilization. His smile seemed to say, poor, underdeveloped human. I was conscious of an uneasy, humiliating perception of my inferior condition. But I had to reluctantly admit that the distance between our societies was enormous. I believe that an Amazon aborigine would experience something similar in his first contact with civilization if he were conscious of that difference. I do not understand a civilization such as ours as a cultural system of mere survival, for we would probably have a better chance of decent survival in a remote jungle rather than in a big city. After that disconcerting encounter, we walked as far as the end of the corridor, where there was a large square circled by buildings, the ground paved with the same kind of stones as were on the road. There were not many pedestrians at the moment. A few beings, physically similar to Godar, walked at a distance. There were women among them. Right in the center of that square, there was a magnificent fountain, 10 meters in diameter, forming an ellipse of colored waters and a structure with various busts in a garden of low bushes. The fountain seemed to be made of only a single block of pink marble. Its wide border was trimmed with a material similar to the buildings. The sculptures seemed to be made of bronze and their features were all different. Impressed by the rarity of the ensemble, I approached the border of the fountain to see the monuments. They were heads whose faces showed diverse origins, probably aliens for their features differed radically. Large or small skulls, eyes at the front, on the sides, big or small, with ears or without them, there was everything. One particular bust was outstanding for two reasons. First, it stood higher than the others with its face turned upwards. Second, the features were that of a human male. I felt there was something familiar in that face, but could not tell what. I slowly walked around the fountain and admiring the details of that sculpture, trying to understand why it was there among all the other faces. The features showed that he belonged to the white race, perhaps Caucasian or Nordic. He looked upwards in an attitude of observation. He had fine features, trimmed beard, mustache, long hair combed to the back and parted almost in the middle. He had a quiet expression. Several times I tried to identify his features that were certainly not a Punian. They looked totally human. Crazy thoughts crossed my mind in search of an identity for that bust. Godar's voice brought me back from my visual hypnotic trance. The guide was further ahead on a lateral street of the square to the right of where we had arrived. I hurried quickly to catch up with him. As I tried to reach Godar, my mind worked. I wonder who this human is. Why did he merit a sculpture? Why here? What was his importance to the civilization? Questions kept coming to my mind. I could not understand the meaning of what I had seen. Mysteries were hidden behind Godar's silence, and up till now he had not informed me why we had come to the city. But I was certain of one thing. I would not leave before I learned all I wanted to. I would have a very serious conversation with Godar, for I knew the Apu were up to something regarding me. There had to be a reason for their discrimination and for what was happening now. After six, though, I was the second person to travel alone to another world. All the others, except for the group that traveled to Moreland with my brother, had had totally different experiences. But why me? Why with me?